want to introduce our next speaker. I'm so excited for this talk. So I, if you were here yesterday, you heard me share that in 2017, you know, I, well, I just finished my, you know, boards and my, my hours for licensure, and I was super tired, fatigued, and uh, was over, really overweight, and, um, and, I, and I was doing triathlons, and I couldn't lose the weight, and, you know, and I thought, okay, now I'm done, like, this should be easy, it should come right off, but it wasn't, and I was eating a lot of carbohydrates. <laughs> No. So um, went to this nutrition conference, saw Dr. Thomas Seyfried, expanded my mind. Conferences are so great for that. And I'm so pleased to introduce Dr. Thomas Durai today because he is a colleague of Dr. Thomas Seyfried. And Dr. Thomas Seyfried set me on my path to a ketogenic lifestyle. And it's my hope that you will also hear some nugget of information at some point in this weekend that really blows your mind too, that keeps you on the path or sets you on your path if you haven't even gotten started or if you fell off. So, Dr. Durai is a medical doctor of Czech Austrian origin. So he is not only an MD, but he's also a PhD. So he might, not to offend any of my other amazing, intelligent, super smart speakers, but he, he may get smartest guy in the room award. <laughs> His scientific research has focused mainly on studying the potential of bioenergetic modulation and cancer metabolism with a special emphasis on glioblastoma, the most aggressive and lethal primary brain tumor. So in his clinical practice, he specializes in health optimization through nutritional and lifestyle interventions. And in his research career, he has authored original peer-reviewed scientific publications, and he's lectured on cancer internationally. And his goal is to advance our understanding of metabolic therapy, making it a part of stand the standard oncology toolkit so that all patients can benefit. Please welcome Dr. Thomas Durai. All right. Uh, can you all hear me? All right, so it's a great, great pleasure to be here today to talk to you about cancer as a mitochondrial metabolic disease. And in, in this presentation, I, I want to give you a little overview of uh, mitochondria, what is the mitochondria function and origin. Uh, she she talked a little bit about the genome part of this, and we will focus more on the mitochondria. Uh, then discuss quickly the theories of carcinogenesis, so what might be the origin of cancer, and then how to approach uh, prevention and, and treatment from the mitochondrial metabolic theory perspective, uh, including but not limited to uh, the ketogenic diet. And, and I know that uh, cancer is, is not always uh, on, on everybody's mind. It's certainly in, on my mind all the time, but um, I think people are more interested in, in prevention. We will discuss that, but um, I think it's important for, for patients to, to have access to the, to the best kind of information and to understand that ketogenic metabolic therapy can be, can be a powerful tool uh, to, to manage cancer. So we need to start at, at the mitochondria. At the, at the most basic level of definition, what are mitochondria? Uh, mitochondria are intracellular organelles in the cytoplasm. These are like little, small, isolated subcompartments uh, that are destined for energy production. Uh, they have many other important functions, such as control of the cell cycle, so the division of the cells, uh, apoptosis, cell signaling, even indirectly uh, immune function. But we, we focus in our research mostly on, on the bioenergetics of uh, the mitochondria, and that is how our mitochondria make energy, ATP, how they make the, the energy that we need to, to live. So just to, to give you a few concepts uh, that are necessary to understand my, my talk, uh, how, is, how is energy generated in, in our cells? So we have three uh, distinct processes, uh, distinct categories, that at the biophysical, uh, biochemical level, make energy for our cells. Uh, we have oxphos, or oxidative phosphorylation, 
Oxidative phosphorylation is, is performed by the mitochondria uh, from different fuels uh, through oxidation of different fuels in TSA cycle, fueling the proton gradient of the electron transport chain and making most of the energy that our non-tumoral oxidative cells use. And this requires oxygen. Uh, there is no mitochondrial metabolism for ATP synthesis without oxygen. And then we have substrate level phosphorylation, or SLP, uh, which you also might uh, hear about, uh, referred about to as fermentation. And SLP uh, usually uh, provides only a, a small fraction of the, of the energy that our cells use. Uh, this is a direct enzymatic process, so this is like an enzymatic step where we have a donor molecule uh, that has a phosphate group, transfers it to, to ADP to make ATP to make energy. And SLP, uh, we usually don't see it in oxidative cells and provides, uh, doesn't, doesn't require oxygen. So SLP is just an enzymatic step where you get a little bit of ATP, not as efficient as, as oxidative phosphorylation. And uh, you can see it upregulated, for example, in hypoxia. When we exercise the muscle and there is not enough oxygen going in, you see SLP of, of glucose making lactate, and, and that is a process uh, for ATP generation. And we also have photosynthesis, but we are not plants, so we can, we can skip that and save a little time. Uh, so our animal cells, I want you to remember that uh, animals uh, with eukaryotic cells get their energy from oxphos and SLP. So these two concepts are, are very important to understand what might happen if the mitochondria is actually damaged. And what else is worth knowing about the mitochondria? I would say two, two, two very important things that we need to keep in mind. First, even though we, we usually represent mitochondria as just one giant mitochondria sitting in a cell making all the ATP, and I myself am guilty of this. This is my own paper, scientific paper, and there is just one mitochondria just making the ATP. The, the reality is that we don't have one mitochondria, but we have the chondrium. The chondrium is the sum of all the mitochondria in any given cell, and we usually have in our mature tissues, such as the liver or the brain or the kidney, we have 100 up to 1,000 mitochondria in a, in a network. And mitochondria are not a static network of organelles. Uh, they are a highly dynamic uh, network of organelles that undergoes constant, uh, constant processes of, of fusion, of fission, of transport. Here we can see a, this is a 10-minute time lapse with a scanning confocal microscope. And we can see mitochondria zipping around the, the microtubules in a cell. So indeed, they are very active. And I, I know this image might look a little unnerving because it looks like like an infection, like little bacteria uh, that might be living inside our cells. And that brings me nicely to the origin of the mitochondria. So where, where do, this, uh, do the mitochondria come from? So the proposed origin of the mitochondria uh, has been proposed in the endosymbiotic theory of mitochondrial origin uh, that poses that around two billion years ago, when the amount of oxygen in the Earth atmosphere started to increase, uh, an, an oxidative alpha proteobacteria uh, that performed oxphos, oxidative phosphorylation, so this would be a, a precursor for uh, the current mitochondria, fused with a hypoxic prokaryotic precursor that performed SLP. So remember, there was no oxygen prior to this mo moment in, in evolution, so the only way to make energy was in hypoxic conditions, what was uh, using SLP. And, and these two form the eukaryotic cells capable of generating ATP in, from different fuels in the presence of oxygen that we see today. So remember that the, the hypoxic prokaryotic precursor of, of SLP, basically the genetic instruction, uh, this brings us back to the genetics, the genetic instruction of prokaryotes, of bacteria, and we can still see today, uh, they, they proliferate. They are highly proliferative. They proliferate as long as there is nutrients in the media. Uh, bacteria, prokaryotic cells that do SLP will proliferate. So uh, when we understand a little bit about uh, mitochondrial function, we can talk about the theories of carcinogenesis. So what is, what is the origin of cancer? The most, uh, let's say, popular idea, at least amongst uh, researchers, is that cancer is a, is a genetic disease. Uh, this is the somatic mutation theory uh, that has a, has a background of more than 100 years. Uh, and in this theory, cancer is caused by mutations in oncogenes and tumor suppressor genes. These can either be inherited. Uh, this is quite rare. These are the, 
the genetic predisposition syndromes such as the BRCA1, BRCA2, Lee-Fraumeni, Lane syndrome, neurofibromatosis, there are many uh, genes that can, polymorphic genes that can make you more susceptible to cancer, and or they can be spontaneous, random, bad luck events, which would apply to, to most cancers. And this idea was developed in the mid 20th century with the discovery of the structure of the DNA, and then further developed in the 90s with the Human Genome Project, uh, and that, that had a very attractive idea at first, which was, uh, let's sequence the whole genome. If cancer is a genetic disease, we sequence the genome, and we will be able to develop targeted therapies against cancer and many other diseases. Uh, the problem with this is uh, that, at least for prevention, if you don't want cancer, you need to avoid mutations. So, of course, you wouldn't, you wouldn't expose yourself to, like, radiation, ionizing radiation or uh, carcinogens. But if you don't want mutations, uh, what you really need to do is to avoid aging, which is not a very, uh, like, useful recommendation from, from a medical perspective. So there are more problems with the, with the SMT, with the somatic mutation theory. Uh, with the Cancer Genome Atlas, so after the, the Human Genome Project, uh, there was another bigger project. Uh, that's the Cancer Genome Atlas, uh, which aimed to sequence more than 30,000 uh, tumoral samples. And indeed, it detected you know, 50 up to 100 different mutations in, in cancer, in different types of cancer. Uh, so the, the naive paradigm was invalidated that just one mutation would cause one cancer. Uh, that doesn't seem to happen. And we also get that different patients, so patient A and patient B, can have exactly the same type of tumor, uh, the same lifestyle, the same background, the same grade, and they can have different tumor mutations. And we also have the nuclear cytoplasmic transfer experiments, which would suggest that uh, mutations are not the origin of, of cancer. We have sometimes no detectable mutations in, in tumor tissues. Or uh, we, we have also mutations in oncogenes, in actual oncogenes and tumor suppressor genes in, in normal tissues. And this has been published in, in the top scientific journals in, in Nature. And I think these, these inconsistencies are starting to be, well, maybe not difficult to ignore because they are being ignored, but they, you, can, you can make the theory more and more convoluted to try to explain these things with, with different uh, ways, epigenetics, microenvironment. You, you can, you can uh, have... Uh, infinite complexity with ad hoc solutions. Uh, but the, the bottom line, the fact is that this approach uh, is simply not working. So of the, of the uh, therapies that have been approved in the last, let's say, 40 years, but actually in the whole lifespan of this theory, the improvements in, in overall survival uh, are quite, quite slim. So this is not working. Uh, so we need a, an alternative way to, to make therapies actually work. So how, how can we make sense of this? Uh, this is a slide from, from Dr. Seafried's recent publication, I think aptly titled, Can the Mitochondrial Metabolic Theory Explain Better the Origin and Management of Cancer Than Can the Somatic Mutation Theory? And for us, the answer is yes, but let's see if I can explain why I try to convince you that this might be the case. So the first thing that we need to understand is whenever we talk about defective respiration, damaged mitochondria, what, what are we talking about? Uh, so defective respiration, or defective oxidative phosphorylation, is chronic damage, uh, sublethal damage, to uh, the mitochondrial structure, the composition, the morphology, the function, the number of mitochondria, the remodeling processes, and of, of course, as especially the bioenergetic functions of, of the mitochondria. So we are not talking just about mitochondrial DNA mutations, which are more associated with inherited mitochondrial diseases. And so if the mitochondria is too damaged, uh, this is often in incompatible with life. So just sublethal damage to the mitochondria, slowly accumulating over time, also explains the oncogenic paradox, which is, uh, it has no answer from the somatic mutation theory, uh, which is how is it possible that different insults that have nothing to do with really DNA damage, that do not cause DNA damage, such as inflammation or hypoxia, can actually also cause cancer. Um, and what happens when, when the mitochondria become slowly damaged? First, we have the production of reactive oxygen species. This is a normal byproduct of mitochondrial metabolism, but an increased oxidative stress will indeed induce mutations in the genome. So we are not saying there are no mutations in the genome. There are many mutations in the genome. But mutations, somatic mutations, are a downstream epiphenomena, are a consequence 
of the mitochondrial damage. They are not the cause of cancer itself. And when uh, the, the mitochondria starts to be damaged, so the chondrium, so remember you have a mix of mitochondria, some are still working, some are damaged, uh, this produces a shift uh, from uh, oxidative phosphorylation, so the normal function of the mitochondria goes down, and we see a compensatory increase in SLP, or substrate level phosphorylation. And SLP uh, requires two main fuels, so cancer cells require two main fuels to grow, uh, glucose, so the SLP of glucose is called the Warburg effect, which I'm sure you are familiar with. And the SLP of glutamine, uh, sometimes forgotten, is called the Q effect. And these two can make energy for the cancer cells. They can uh, provide energy and even biosynthesis uh, products uh, regardless of the presence of oxygen. So you can be doing SLP, Warburg effect, the Q effect, even if there is no oxygen, and that is why cancer cells can actually grow even in, in hypoxia. And if you take a look back at at evolution, what kind of organism performed SLP of glucose and glutamine? This was indeed the, the prokaryote that, uh, that existed prior to the fusion with the mitochondria. And that explains why when the mitochondria is damaged, what we see is a, a, a regression, let's say, to an ancient phenotype, genetic phenotype, and metabolic phenotype for unbridled proliferation. As all prokaryotes, the only genetic instruction for the SLP organisms is unbridled proliferation. And this also explains all the different hallmarks of cancer, and we uh, conclude that the, the genome is metabolically determined. Uh, the genome is still important, it's like having the recipe, but if you don't have the ingredients, the actual metabolites and the energy, uh, then the genome by itself uh, doesn't mean uh, much. So with this perspective in, in mind, uh, let's talk a little bit about prevention and treatment. Unfortunately, I don't have uh, that much time to get into, into prevention, but I think most of the other talks in, in this conference are going to focus how to keep your mitochondria healthy. Um, and uh, so I would say that I want you to think about prevention from this perspective, from the mitochondrial perspective, as a milder, you know, more light version of the things that we are going to do for treatment. But I think cancer patients are, are seeking information and they would benefit more from having information about how to actually treat cancer once it is uh, developed. But of course, prevention is key. You need an anti-inflammatory diet, exercise, fasting, hormetic stressors, and maybe some supplementation when, when necessary. But I want to talk about metabolic therapy in cancer. And I usually structure this in three levels of, of intervention. And this is my, my personal approach, and there might be different ways to go about this. And uh, I should preface this by saying that this is an ongoing uh, active area of, of research. And um, so everything I'm going to say is more from what I would do with the information that I have in, in my head uh, if I was facing a, a cancer diagnosis. But each patient is different, and it needs to be personalized. So the first level. Uh, and these, these first two are done at the individual patient level, so you don't really need a doctor to do this. Uh, but the, the first level, uh, for this you need a doctor, is to learn as much as possible about cancer, about the cancer that you might have. And I, I don't say this lightly, and this is something that you won't see published anywhere, nobody's talking about it, but I think uh, looking at, at what I have seen, uh, this is really not being done correctly in standard clinical practice. So the, the patient or the family members they need to have absolute knowledge, and I mean this, like really absolute knowledge about what to expect from standard of care. That means that uh, the patient or the family members and the oncology team, they need to sit down and actually read the studies. This requires a lot of time. Uh, read the studies that would justify whatever approach from the standard uh, treatment protocols might be, might be offered and to see if it's justified, if it makes sense. So the chemoradiotherapy protocols, targeted therapies, immunotherapies, these are all like nice sounding things, but uh, these, are, these are the gold standard because they are based on, on big clinical trials with hundreds of patients. And uh, the patients really need to understand, because the data is there, they, they should understand what is the expected efficacy, uh, what is the to toxicity, what are the adverse effects. And of course, we need to use metabolic imaging, anatomical imaging, uh, tumor biomarkers, have a, have a good uh, follow-up plan to evaluate the response to to therapy if we are doing standard of care. And then we would move to a strict lifestyle interventions. And I, I use the word, the moniker strict 
because the ketogenic diet for cancer has some characteristics that are, it's not the same ketogenic diet that you might do just for weight loss or, or diabetes. Uh, fasting, exercise, supplementation, and I think at the second level, uh, this can be done by, by every patient. There are synergistic opportunities with standard of care, uh, if you choose to do it, in, in, all, in all patients. I have yet to see a, a cancer that wouldn't benefit from, uh, from doing this, this second level. And then, in the third level, we have pharmacology, we have repurposed drugs and, and novel agents that are still in clinical trials to target uh, mainly metabolism, but other, other processes as well, or complementary systemic or local therapies such as hyperbaric oxygen, and we will get into, into detail uh, on this. So, uh, the ketogenic metabolic therapy. Uh, this is, I call this a special form of the ketogenic diet. Uh, because it usually requires caloric restriction, which you also might do if you want to lose weight, and in fasting, and this is something that's like the, the baseline. We want to get this right. And if the weight of the patient doesn't allow it, which um, is quite common, then it needs to be cyclical. Uh, there, are weights, uh, there are periods of, of weight loss and there are periods of weight recovery. For me personally, I, I, this might be like a little a uh, like controversial opinion. For me, the diet composition itself is inconsequential in the sense that what we are trying to achieve is specific measurable parameters. Uh, the ketogenic diet is the only way to achieve those parameters, but the diet composition itself can be, can be tailored to, to each patient. And we want to have basically undetectable levels of insulin, uh, glucose levels as physiologically low as possible, the BHB levels usually uh, mirror inversely the, the glucose levels. They're usually intermediate or high, and they, they might have their own benefits on their own. There's a lot of research uh, looking just at the effects of, of ketone bodies in, in isolation. Inflammation, of course, is as low as possible. And we should be seeing reduced tumor growth if we are doing this correctly. Now, how to measure this? So uh, the GKI, or the glucose ketone index, is, is quite an easy way to to understand the, or to estimate the expected therapeutic benefit from, uh, from the ketogenic metabolic therapy. And these days, it's quite easy to measure, I have to say. I, I'm grateful for companies as, as KetoMojo, because they have made the, the life of clinicians much easier to actually get the data. But what is the optimal number? Now, the GKI, uh, if you take a look, is simply the level of glucose in millimolar divided by the level of ketones in, in millimolar just a division, uh, that give you an index. And we usually aim at a GKI of under two, and ideally of, of as close to one as possible, or even under one. Now, a GKI of one, if you visualize it, is basically the, the same number of, of glucose than, than of ketones. So you might have four millimolar of glucose and four millimolar of ketones. That would give you a, a GKI of, of one. And then you can either go high, higher in ketones or lower, lower uh, in, in glucose. And I would say my intuition and looking at the available scientific literature is that the glucose levels themselves are uh, on itself are an impor important factor for therapeutic efficacy. Uh, so how low do you need to go uh, will depend on how aggressive your, your cancer might be. Um, I also have to mention for ketones, uh, ketones are a non fermentable uh, metabolic fuel. That means that they can only be used by our mitochondria, by oxidative phosphorylation. And we already established that cancer mitochondria is damaged. And uh, so ketones are really the fuel for our normal cells to compensate for the lack of glucose that we are trying to push down as, as much as possible. And um, uh, for, I would say, this might be still a little controversial in the scientific uh, literature and the scientific word, the research, uh, I have yet to see a, a cancer cell that would be able to, to use ketones for ATP, for energy, to proliferate in the absence of glucose and glutamine. So this is a challenge for the scientific community. If anyone knows of any cancer cell that might use ketones to proliferate in the absence of glucose and glutamine, I would be very happy to, to find that uh, kind of cell because we have not seen it yet. And in, in general, for the GKI, caloric restriction, ketogenic diet, and fasting, that's what allows you to, to sustain a, a good GKI uh, for, for longer extended periods of, of time. 
Now, what about supplementation? So we are still in the second level, and there is an endless list of supplements. Uh, this is not really, we, we don't have time to get into, into detail for, for each of these. It's just for, for cancer patients, I think this is gonna be recorded. So cancer patients can, can pause this and go into the scientific literature and find information on each of these compounds which have shown benefit either in preclinical studies or small pilot clinical studies for, for cancer treatment. And the idea is to use nutrition and supplementation to target cancer cells selectively, uh, selectively and to optimize the mitochondrial health in our normal cells and also to uh, limit standard of care toxicity if we decide to do it and to improve the efficacy uh, of, of standard of care. What about glutamine? So we have talked about SLP, uh, substrate level phosphorylation, and we, we said that there are two fuels for cancer to grow. There is glucose. We can target glucose quite easily uh, with uh, ketogenic metabolic therapy, uh, with the diet, but what about glutamine? Uh, glutamine is a non-essential amino acid. That means that, unfortunately, even that sounds great, but that means that our bodies can, can make it on, on their own from different precursors. So glutamine cannot be eliminated from the diet. Even if you are fasting, you will still find glutamine in, in your plasma circulating. So the only way to target glutamine is either by supplements. Once again, there is a list of them. Uh, problem with supplements is they usually have low potency, so you need to combine a few supplements together to actually inhibit glutamine in a, in a meaningful way. Or these can be pharmacological agents. Some of these are FDA approved, others are still in, in clinical research. The problem with these is also they are usually tested in monotherapy. So for example, we are doing standard of care and just one glutamine inhibitor, and we are not expecting to see great results because you always need to target glucose and glutamine at the same time. So that is something that I think all cancer patients need to, uh, need to keep in mind that always glucose and glutamine uh, needs to be targeted at the same time. And in the third level, uh, we have the pharmacological and systemic therapies. These are guided by the results of the first two. So we are either doing standard of care or we know that standard of care will not work because from the first level, remember, we know everything there is to know about what to expect from the, from the traditional treatments. And we are doing level, T, level two and we are looking at the tumor. Is it responding? Are the tumor biomarkers uh, going in the right direction? Is the size decreasing? Or we might uh, consider this to prevent a, a tumor that has high rates of, of recurrence. Once again, there are many ways to target uh, metabolism. Uh, we usually focus on repurposed drugs. So these are FDA approved off-label indications, uh, prescriptions that you might use also to target cancer. We, of course, want to uh, target cancer metabolism first, so SLP of glucose and glutamine. Uh, but there are many other processes that after this is done, we can also target, such as inflammation, autophagy, uh, angiogenesis. We can try to potentiate the immune system modulate the redox, uh, redox balance, et cetera, et cetera. And there are many different protocols that have been proposed to do this. Uh, I want to remember uh, once more that always you need to use a multi-layered approach, so you need to target glucose and glutamine at the same time, and you might throw, throw in there some, some other uh, pathway regulators to, to try to help with, uh, with the cancer uh, treatment. And uh, then in the third level, we also have the systemic therapies. Uh, the, the one that I am most familiar with is HIBOT, uh, hyperbaric oxygen therapy. And uh, this, uh, together with ozone therapy and IV vitamin C, they have similar mechanisms of action in the sense that you are trying to increase ROS production, so reactive oxygen species, in the tumor cells where the mitochondria is damaged to try to selectively kill uh, tumoral cells. There is also hypothermia that, uh, according to the scientific literature, combines quite well with standard of care. And there are many, many, many others. Uh, I would say that for, for cancer patients, uh, you know, mon money is one thing, but not to lose time, because uh, often you are, you are pressed on, on time. I would go into the scientific literature and try to find a little bit of information about whatever other complementary therapy uh, you might be, be considering to, to see if it actually makes sense to treat cancer, if the biological mechanism makes sense, and if there are some published results that might indicate that it might be helpful. And lastly, this is my last slide. I still have three minutes. So I would like to address the, the controversy, the skepticism, and, and the personal freedom uh, that I think patients should have. 
the, the question we are asking is whether metabolic therapy should be an adjuvant therapy, something you do, you do on the site, or whether it should be the standard therapy for cancer. Right now, uh, for better or for worse, each patient has the ultimate decision power. This means that uh, the burden of responsibility is shifted from the oncologist uh, back to the, to the patient. And I know this is an uncomfortable position to be in uh, because you are, you are facing life-threatening diagnosis, and that's perhaps not the best time to try to learn about cancer biology and cancer metabolism and, and understand how these things work. Uh, so the protocols uh, for metabolic therapy are being developed, they are being tested in clinical research, but right now each case still needs to be individualized. And I don't know if you remember the case of, of Brittany Maynard. Uh, Brittany, uh, this happened eight years ago, Brittany was a young woman that was diagnosed with uh, glioblastoma, with brain cancer, and she underwent surgery. And then, as would be expected, the, the tumor came back, and she decided to, to take her own life, uh, to commit medically-assisted suicide. Uh, so I think she, she did the first level. She understood very well what to expect from standard of care, which in case of, of brain cancer, advanced brain cancer, is basically virtually no benefit for survival. And I think she saw no other option, no other alternative. And if we compare this with, with Pablo Kelly, Pablo Kelly, you have seen him in, in yesterday's uh, Cancer Revolution uh, documentary, uh, so he's still alive and well. This was a similar case eight years ago also. He was diagnosed with uh, brain cancer. He uh, underwent surgery and decided to, uh, to not do chemotherapy and radiation and just use uh, ketogenic metabolic therapy to manage his, his cancer. So he just stayed in the second level. He didn't even go to the third level where we have more options. Uh, and we are trying to publish these things. So this is published by Dr. Seafried's team. I think as the more case reports we have in the scientific literature, they are useful for, for case, cancer patients to go in and to learn about. And uh, if we have hundreds of patients, then they will be difficult to ignore. So I, I want to say that I understand the skepticism and the frustration from oncologists uh, because they, there's a tendency to put everything that is alternative into the same basket, uh, but metabolic therapy is not an alternative therapy. Uh, it's based on a large body of scientific evidence. And if, if treating cancer according to evolutionary biology is considered alternative, then I think we have a big, big problem in, in the cancer field. So uh, our hope and our effort is that uh, very soon metabolic therapy will be a part of the standard oncology toolbox. And I think uh, it, one day it will be the, the first approach. It's the first thing that you will try when you are diagnosed with cancer. And then if it doesn't work, then of, of course there are many, many other options uh, that, uh, that might be attempted. And that's it. I, I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.